Roll camera. Mics up. And action. Live from Australia, streaming around the world. Around the world. The most cinematic podcast of your week awaits. This is Bottomless Popcorn with your host, Morgan Brown. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan and this is another episode of Bottomless Popcorn. Uh, on today's episode, we have a guest named uh, Leon Murray and he is a commercial and corporate voiceover artist. So if you're from Australia, you've probably heard him on ads on television for things like Colgate, uh, things like that. But also if you're from Australia, you've probably recognized his voice as the voice of Big Brother as well. So that is uh, pretty cool. We're going to talk to Leon today about his top four favorite films. And you'll soon work out that Leon is uh, quite a film fanatic. So this episode and the following one is going to be quite unique because this is our first two-part episode. So this episode today, we're just going to cover his first two films. And then in the part two, we'll cover his following uh, two films as well. So today, let's get straight into it and speak to Leon about his top four favorite films. Hi, I'm Leon Murray. Uh, the last movie I saw at the theater was No Time to Die. Oh, very nice. Mm. James Bond, 007. Ironically, there was plenty of time to die. It was two hours and 45 minutes long. Yes, heaps yeah. of time. Yeah. More than enough a, time. Yeah, it was a good one. It was a good one. Yeah. yeah. Was that your... I was going to say, was that your first one back to the cinema after lockdown? But you just didn't lock down. You're in Brisbane. No, so yeah, was... we're, I'm pretty lucky, man. I, we got away with it uh, very lightly in uh, Queensland. Yeah. yeah, in Brisbane. Uh, so, no. Although I have to say, like, it movie going has been affected uh, by it somehow. I don't know if it's psychological or yeah. I mean, physically, I was still fine to go along most of the time. But like, uh, it felt like movies sort of left my life for a while. Yeah, and they I gotta say they are roaring back. <laughs> they really are. And yeah. particularly in Australia, I think all our releases got delayed Impressed. whereas everyone else started going because we kind of yeah. had a delayed we had a delayed COVID uh, surge, I guess you would say. So right. all our releases have been pushed to this back end of the year. And now everything is like week after week. It's a massive, a massive title. We had Venom last week. Yeah. June's just come out today. Yeah. Yeah. So where um we're we are spoiled for choice. We've got a exactly. glut, a Hollywood yeah. glut, yeah, to it's catch expensive. up on. So I'm loving it. Yeah, it's um, it's real good. There's plenty, and there's plenty more before the end of the year that we'll there are, have to check yeah. out as well too. So I'm quite excited. Well, um, me too, man. Thanks. This is a treat. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. No, thank you for um agreeing to come on. I was gonna of course. say I uh, so how I come I've come to ask Leon for those of you listening is uh, I followed Leon on Twitter. Uh, probably around the late, or sorry, not the late, the early 2000 teens, I want to say. And Leon big, big does mistake. a... <laughs> that was your first mistake. Following it me. was. Uh, and Leon does... How many characters do you get on Twitter now? How, what is it, like 240 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, they doubled it, I think. 240. 280. Yeah. yeah. So 280. I was doing, tweeting like movie reviews, like quote unquote yes. reviews. You can't really review a movie in 140 characters. Yes. I used to be like, you know, punchy, fun bathed in neon go see it like <laughs> and now they doubled it and i can get away with a bit more of a review in 280 characters so i've uh yeah. i think i've reviewed 836 movies now yeah uh, nice. since 2011 i think uh yes and there were, there's been three children in between there so there's <laughs> <laughs> been Do some you, pauses yeah how that's that's called the we views and they're all hashtags so obviously if anyone wants to go and find these search that hashtag on Twitter, you'll find yeah. eight eight hundred and how many did you say? Eight hundred and thirty-six. You can work your way through. You can see how yep. shit they were at the beginning, <laughs> all the way through to how shit they are now. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and then you obviously you're just saying too, you've had you've had kids in between. So do you feel like I don't know if it's your movie taste, but your palate in movies mm. is perhaps are you asking a little further than you would have liked? Morgan, if I wouldn't have ordinarily we viewed Clifford the Big Red Dog, are you saying? Yes, I yeah. am asking that. <laughs> yeah, I think I probably wouldn't have perhaps bothered with uh, yes, yeah, some of the uh, of the movies intended for the uh, let's say the younger end of the spectrum. Yes. Um, but I also take a little bit of pride in you know performing, I guess, a public service for other uh, seemingly similarly frustrated adults who yes. need to know when you're sitting there, when you're in there in the foyer, the movie foyer, and you're like, do I waste, you know, my 18 bucks, uh, you know, per ticket plus add-ons plus, you know, sour worms plus whatever else they talk <laughs> you into uh, on this movie or that movie. It's like, well, at least then you can look at and sort of go, all right, it is worth 
seeing the new it's bit you know i'll go see the new pixar not the new like hotel transylvania 7 or whatever yes. you know it might be so you know yes. that's that's useful in some ways yes true that is uh <laughs> i'm sure when i have kids i'll be looking back at wave views to see if it's worth it as well for me <laughs> <laughs> i hope i can help yeah <laughs> Um, we're going to go to the movies today and we're going to see your uh, top four favorite films. And mm. uniquely to your list, you've actually picked a film from each decade starting from the 70s, which is pretty cool. And we're going Mate, to go through those. Yeah, I couldn't shortly. help myself. Just when you yeah. said that was the, the concept, I'm like, well, let's just take it. Let's get in the DeLorean. Yes. Let's take a little trip, <laughs> little trip through time. And then I've sort of cheated a bit because I've gone 70s, 80s, 90s and double O's. Um, but you know, I think, oh, I mean, we're in 2021, the double O's that like could technically that could span the last 21 years. So yes. I've, you know, it's a little mini cheat. You'll find out when, when we get to what I yes. mean, but, um, uh, yeah, I thought that could be a fun approach, you know, and t- let me tell you what, I all, I nearly put a bullet in my eye trying to figure out one from the seventies that yes. <laughs> there is so it's my favorite decade by far of, of filmmaking, it, especially American filmmaking of the seventies. I don't know if anything comes close to it. It was, it's, yeah. it's incredible. So yeah, sure. I've gone a bit avant-garde with that choice, but I'm sure we'll get to all that. Yes. No, nice. We'll get all the way through it. I think it'll be good. Um, let's go. Let's, uh, let's start. So we're going to the movies. We're going to take where a are we? stop at the Kenya. All right. We're going oh, to okay. go to your <laughs> local, Titan which is Lux. Reading Cinemas. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. New they're, Market. They're good. They're, good. they're oh, very good. The Titan Lux. Yeah. yeah. So, but we're going to stop at the candy bar. So what are you thinking about for your, uh, your, your pre movie snacks? You know what I'm going to do to you here? And I'm not, I'm not a big sweets guy. If there was any, I'd stray for the classic bag of Maltesers. I just love yep. to, you know, I'll, I'll delicately suck the coating off and then get that multi crumbly yes. goodness inside. Uh, I don't, I'm not a massive, big, sweet toothy cinema guy. I love a, I love a, a savory snack, a supreme savory snack. The popcorn, of course you can't beat it, but it does get stuck in your teeth, get stuck in your throat. I'm always the guy's probably, you know, choking halfway through, <laughs> yeah, you know, coughing. Yep. You don't want that. I'm going to go the, 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 the sweet chili red rock deli, sweet okay. chili sour cream yes. chips. Mate, I'd knocked off a bag of those during No Time yeah. to Die the other night. <laughs> the, the piquancy yeah. of the sweet chili uh, and the, the slight kick in there perfectly yep. matched the movie action. Yep. And you, to go with it, in a perfect world, and this is this is what kills me. In, in the states, you could have your you could have your choice of cool, refreshing beverage. Here, yeah. you've got like four flavors. Yeah. I would love a cherry coke, man, to go with this. Ooh, uh okay yeah nice. i would kill for a cherry exotic. coke at the movies yep. i've never had we we're stuck in australia with you know yeah. like sprite and you know what else Fanta if you're lucky yeah a bit of lemonade there right i'm always just, shocked when someone asks for mountain dew i'm always a bit like yeah you sure imagine that the syrup yeah. in that would be you know yeah. it <laughs> hasn't been touched since 2014 yeah, exactly. no, piss, you know that stuff sweet chili chips and a cherry coke man let's do it yeah ring them okay. up so you don't give a shit about the person sitting behind you, and you're going to be rustling your hand in that in that alfoil. I I'm packet. a con- I'm a considerate rustler. I try to okay. open open gently, maybe in the trailer, yep. see not disturbing the movie, and then I'll and then I'll really kind of delicately, yeah, like a claw machine just really <laughs> doesn't matter if you miss, you know. <laughs> That's it. And the crunching, yep. I'll try to try to crunch in the cheeks, not the teeth. Yep. So sure. You know. Got but, Look, it's yeah, about. You I mean, it. my pleasure comes first, man. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, you paid all that money to go to the movies. Exactly. You do what you want. Yeah. Um, what about when you go to the movies? Are you like ordinarily, are you looking to see it on the biggest screen? Like, are you trying to see it that way or you don't care? You just going to the movies. Do you prefer like the recliner seats or do you go for the gold dance where you have uh, brought into you as well? It's not bother me so much. I, I do. It is fancy when you get in there and you've got the ones that were, you know, you have to push the button and, and you're leaning back. It's pretty cool. But the, the downside with the kind of, deluxe versions if you go to gold class what have you that i think no one really talks about is you're stuck in pairs like if you like i went to no time to die with my brother-in-law and my father-in-law because the three of us he's been hanging out for this for two years you know take your old man along go along with the father-in-law but obviously three of us so that kind of rules out gold class it's like well you're not gonna sit as i'm sitting in an odd pair yeah Yeah, cozy pair and then he's over there and the you know Hey, how are you going over there? Like across yeah. the Did you aisle. see that? Did you see that bit? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, big screen would be very big screen, obviously preferable. As long as I don't mind so much the screen if this as long as there's big 
sounds like yes. like killer. Well, I should have asked you that then. Actually, like we we didn't mention it just before, but your background is in uh, like uh, voice uh, voice work, like for corporate and uh, commercial uh, production as well. So you are really aware of the sound as well. So I was going to ask, what is your? Do you take much notice of that when you're going? Yeah, to the, I to do. the cinema. I think it just, I think there's an unsung appreciation for how great, incredible speakers and great theatre setup can just, like I saw June, I was lucky enough to go to the June like premiere here in Brisbane and it was in, yeah, the biggest, luxest, it was enormous. Like it was yeah. just an incredible theatre. And I, I was, it was like, you know, the uh, guy in the THX, guy in the Simpsons where his teeth yes. shadow and the- <laughs> Like it's yep. <laughs> it just yeah. was and June is the I mean, if there's yeah, yeah. any movie that you can revel in incredible because it's not just the sound design, it's the way it integrates with the score, which are both I think in my we view for June, uh that the term bowel loosening was employed. Yes, okay. <laughs> um and it's true. Yeah. Uh well, it's not true. I didn't didn't quite shit myself, thankfully, <laughs> but um yeah, it really made a difference. So it was yeah. it's, it was nuts. And I think if you can if you've got an appreciation, I mean, you could say the same thing for concerts and stuff. Like if you have an appreciation for that, that bass and that rumble and it being applied like intelligently as well. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a holistic thing. It's right from the guys recording that and, and designing that and having that be heard, you know, in the best possible way, but then having a theater that's set up to receive and then, and then deliver that in the way that yeah. it was intended is, it, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. It's a, that's the kind of thing where you go, man, you, like take my 15 bucks because you've earned yeah. that and more, you know, you deserve it. Yeah, it's just an experience, sure. you know? So yeah, yeah, I think it matters a lot. It counts. Are you like being as into sound as you are? Are you aware of like the different like audio formats theatrically? Like, can you distinguish between 5.1, 7.1, uh, Dolby Atmos and that kind of stuff? Like, do you know? I'm not, that I'm not that good. Go no, that'd yeah. be more for a couple of my super audiophile sure. nerd mates that are in fully that work in you know audio post-production and they i think yeah. they would uh be all across that flavor but yeah. um nah just for me it's just like if it's got to be crisp you know yeah and you can tell the difference i think for sure <laughs> no it's, it's i agree there's been some really th- through working at the cinema i was what the theater i worked at did a refurbishment where they took it from a 7.1 setup and added in the Dolby Atmos mm. um, speakers and being there when they were kind of calibrating the room and teaching us how to use it and, and how to, how to set content up to play through. It was pretty, um, pretty neat to say. And, but wow. like just having the differences pointed out, like seeing them play clips and then switching between audio formats and noticing the difference of like the disappearing channels or the, the channels like coming into the room was like kind of made all the, all the difference but some of the wow. it's kind of like mixing in the formats too was something yeah. i spoke about a lot and obviously you can't play any movie and just distribute it through those channels it just doesn't work like that it has to be kind of specifically yeah right made to be shown that way and just their explanation of what it allows like sound designers and stuff to do was kind of kind of um i know kind of incredible like I, i'd never yeah. really thought about it that much until i'd really seen it I'd yeah. heard about it for quite a while. I'd never seen a film that way until like 2018 in Dolby wow. Atmos. And then I was like, oh, that's, that is the absolute stuff. That is, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. the way to do it if you know about it. So it's, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's, it's so clever how it works and it's, yeah, I still don't fully cool. understand it all either, by the way. I just, I, the ex, the, the knowledge I think I have of it, I'm sure isn't all correct, yeah. but it it's, it definitely makes me appreciate it more when I go and see a film yes presented yeah. that way i'm just like geez that's that's crazy but oh, it's also an immersion me. thing too you know like a of course yeah like it, it it's really it's it's clever it's it's awesome. well i think uh, yeah june is a great example of that um and yeah i can't really i can't put it any other way other than just remember sitting there just feeling like i was wrapped in this blanket of, of sound you know it was yeah. so immersive so yeah hats yeah. off to those guys i think they'll be they could, they'll be, you know, get, picking up some awards and stuff for, for sure. For I sure. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. I, um, this hasn't really much to do with that. I just remember uh, seeing Inception when mm. I was a teenager at the cinema. 
And I remember my drink going flat just because of how bassy that was. Like I just, <laughs> I was like, oh, this tasted better before the movie started. Yeah, like, Christopher <laughs> Nolan. Yeah. Whilst I appreciated your latest film, I do take umbrage with one particular issue of your sound design. <laughs> my my cherry Coca Cola <laughs> went as flat as a tack. Yeah, that can so be no good. That's hilarious. You know, it could be on the poster. It's like. Magnificent. <laughs> Peter Travis, drink Rolling flat. Stone says it's the film of the year. So good, my soft drink went flat. Yes. That's, that actually It'd be terrific. That. That's very good. <laughs> It'd be good. Um, do you remember the first movie you ever saw at the cinema? Man, I was thinking about this. Sort of yet, yes and no. I don't really remember exactly, but I have a really good feeling. I think it was a film about... It, was, it would have been in the 80s, so full mm-hmm. disclosure, I was born in the extraordinarily late seventies. Like you couldn't get much later in the seventies. Right. So I might've been five, four or five. I think my Nana took me to see a movie called Benji, which is like a dog movie. Okay. Benji was like a sort of a lassie type, you know, situation. I think it was a little um, terrier type of thing. Anyway, Benji was kind of a bit of a famous doggo for kids in the eighties. So I think Benji was the first movie with Nana. All I, I kind of remember like one freeze frame kind of moment in my mind of like being in this big room with big with seats and seeing mm-hmm. this thing on this big screen. That's I, it's like a, a glimpse and yeah. nothing else. But um, I do remember, <laughs> I don't know if it was the next movie I saw. It was weird. I didn't really see movies as a kid. Like I don't, like I remember, I even vividly remember being um, 10, I think, and other kids in my class were going to see uh, Batman, as in the Michael Keaton 1989 Keaton Batman with Jack sure. Nicholson. And I just remember having no interest in that at all at yeah. 10 years of old age. They, my other friends were going off to see Batman. I'm like, oh, okay, how if you like? See yeah. you later. Like, I just didn't care. Yeah. It's really strange. Give, no, like, I've made up for lost time. Like, I care so much now, but I didn't, we just didn't go. We didn't do that as a family, really. I don't know. Yeah. And then, one other thing I remember, not so much about the movie, but I went with a school friend. I might have been 11 or something, 11 or 12. And we went to see the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay. I think that was about 1989 or 1990. So I might have been 10 or 11. Um, but um, I don't remember the I, You know, I know the movie, but I don't remember the movie so much as I remember being in this movie. And about halfway through, I was like, oh, I need to wait. And... I like was pretty shy as a kid and didn't, you know, I was like, sure. I hadn't been to the movies that much, right? Yeah, so we're yeah, in this yeah. big movie theater. I think it was in the city. It was sort of all kind of intimidating. And it was one of those movies where, uh, you know, the you walk into the movie theater sort of halfway down the theater, you know, when you get in, yep. obviously there's stairs that go all the way back up. I'd forgotten about all that. So I got out of my seat. I'm going <laughs> up the stairs and I just kept walking up the stairs. And then suddenly I'm at the back of the theater and there's yep. no way to get out. I'm like, where am I? And there's no, you know, I'd just completely forgotten yeah, where's yeah. the exit to this theater. So I didn't know what to do. So I couldn't find the exit. So I just went back to my seat and I needed to wee so <laughs> badly by the end of this. Like I remember being 11, I was just clutching at my little, you know, in between my yeah. legs <laughs> as an 11 year old. It was so annoying because I just wasn't really like, I guess, brave enough to just ask like, where's the exit? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Just yeah. one of those things, but it's always stayed with me. Yeah. Like so uncomfortable. It just sucks. Like everyone knows that feeling, right? Yeah. And sure. um, yeah, I fortunately we, you know, the film ended and and I made it. Made it. <laughs> Everything <laughs> was fine. Yeah. But uh, god damn, I just even thinking back to it now, I'm like annoyed for like that little kid, you know, who yeah, like yeah, no yeah. one, you know, yeah. who just lost his his who couldn't get out of the cinema. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Just, sure. just a dumb memory, but um yeah. anyway. Thank you, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, so, got it. <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah, and and being in the sewer the whole time didn't exactly help. Didn't either. help. Yeah, I'm sure it didn't. <laughs> uh, my next question was going to be, what's a movie you remember more for the experience around seeing it? But I think mm. you might have just answered it almost with that one. But I do you have any others? Did. I do, man. Yeah. I had the best year in 1999. Um, yes. Our local theatre, it was just sort of like one of those little sort of dodgy independent theaters. It was mm. called the El Dorado. I'll give it a shout okay. out. Yeah. Um, and the El Dorado in Tripoli in 1999 had these mystery screenings. Sure. And I don't know why, and I haven't, I don't think they've done it since. And I don't know yeah. why I got so lucky with this mystery screening thing, yeah. but it was literally like films that were going to come out in two months time, but they yeah. had these mystery screenings and you didn't know what they were. 
and everyone pay, paid for their ticket, mystery training, screening, 7.30 Friday night, and go along. And I got American Pie, which was just brilliant because, it, you know, everyone had kind of was aware of this. Yeah. Oh, we've heard this, this gross out movie coming. And, you know, but it just, it, you know, we were teenagers. It was insane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other one was The Sixth Sense. Sure. And like, if there's any movie that you want to not have spoiled, you know, and this is virtually like pre-internet. It's certainly pre, you know, anything we have now facebook social media like so the the i guess we were lucky the only way it could have gotten you know spoil would have been in like a newspaper review or something like that mm -hmm. but i i remember so clearly sitting in that theater and we didn't know what we we're going to see the lights go down the title comes up that spidery writing comes up the sixth sense there was genuinely like a a full a tsunami whisper through the audience. Oh my god! It's so much. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we knew what it was, but we didn't yeah. know why it was good and why and was it, was it spoken in about. was it in release yet too, or was it like it These probably it was were movies that weren't one? weren't they were it was like far in advance, like it was yeah. like not not close to being released in Australia, but back then probably it had been Overseas, yeah, either the released in the states shared, yeah. or people were aware of it, right? Yeah, and the excitement was so palpable for these experiences. American Pie, because it was hilarious and no one had seen yes. anything like it before. But The Sixth Sense, you know, just for obvious reasons, and it, they were just some of the best movie experiences because they were this mystery thing. We didn't know what we were going to get and they just turned out to be like, you know that feeling when you're in a, in a packed audience and everyone was on board? And I, I genuinely remember that, that, shiver of excitement like ripple through the entire audience when the yeah. sense title came up um because we knew we're in for something that oh it's this new this Shyamalan guy and it's like meant to be insane yeah. and it was it was brilliant it was just yeah, awesome. brilliant no nice that's when i remember working uh through the theaters and mystery screenings being something they often discussed and considered doing yeah. i think we only did a maybe one or two that i can think of and i think they were more for like thriller kind of films as well so kind of in line yeah. i guess with what the sixth sense yeah was but I, I can for some reason remember i can't remember if it went ahead but there was big talk about doing it for the first in betweeners film doing that as a mystery screen. oh yeah cool and almost like an early word of mouth one yeah like right pay to go see but allow them to talk after about it ahead of its release to kind of drum yeah. up some enthusiasm it's a great idea. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It it's just, but really it just, we're, we're kind of, we had a conversation yesterday and I think we we're kind of talking about this. That doesn't really happen anymore because everything kind of needs to come out in line at the exact same point around the mm. world. And like the, the potential for spoilers and stuff, I think is just such a concern. It's, true. it's a shame that nothing can organically build anymore. It's sort of like, yeah, um, yeah it, you're right. It's very, it's very hyper-engineered. And yeah. um, I think, you know, it's sort of, yeah, it has to be because the combination of like the kind of, it's the financial risks involved is so uh, enormous. And, and yet you couple that with anyone could spoil or leak anything at literally the, the push of a button instantly. Yeah, exactly. Like with the reach and that, you know, we're all broadcasters now. Exactly. So yeah, it's, uh, I wouldn't want to be in that. I mean, I, speaking of, you know, no time to die. Like we're, you know, these guys sitting on, we all knew that it was, you know, Daniel Craig's sort of last run at it. And then it, just to be sitting on that, just to be essentially Secret, have that on the yeah. shelf, you know, and For then go, years. look, it's hard enough to try and, keep stuff in the bag while it's been shot and post-produced and whatever. Yeah. And then another 18 months goes by and you're just going, mm -hmm. you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be um, exactly. a distributor or a producer in that position because no chance. you just go, are we going to make our yeah. $300 million even, dollars back here? I will even say that for um, like James Bond and then even just Venom had a pretty, that credit scene in Venom was pretty, um, to keep that a secret for as long as they did too, that was pretty... Yeah, right. Kind of incredible, I thought as well. I was a bit like, geez, they did well to yeah, they must have some conceal good that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So <laughs> and then like you think about it too, like the amount of the the crews and the people that work on that, it's not a small amount of people that are aware. Mm. Like a, a decent number of people have to know about. Yeah. I know, and all it's gonna that. take is someone slightly ancillary, like a you know caterer on set or a, a key props or something mm -hmm. then goes home says something to their partner that partner yeah. goes to the you know chiropractor you know yeah, like yeah it's yeah, exactly. amazing isn't it that they yeah, yeah. 
but it, yeah, I, I was quite surprised that those secrets were all kept under wrap for as long yeah. as I thought that was really cool. Um, what about movies based on books, comic books, novels, that kind of thing? Do you ever take much notice of of those, or are you the kind of person that'll maybe if you liked the film enough, you'll come back and look at it after if you didn't read it before? Not really. Um, books. I mean, yeah, no, I didn't like. I. I I know, you know, Gillian Flynn adapted Gone Girl. I love, you know, Gone Girl. And, um, but I did, yeah, it's sort of not anything I sort of need to reach for. What I might do is like watch an original if there's a sequel coming. Like, I, you know, mm-hmm. I knew Coming to America, Coming to America was about to hit. So I'll watch Coming yeah. to America. Um, or, you know, Terminator Dark Fate, things like that, just sort of almost to get the flavor, not necessarily, yep. yeah, you know, to sort of like, um, yeah, 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 I know. Be, what you mean yeah caught up but just sort of to prime myself a bit in, into that world mm-hmm. um the book thing i don't think i've yeah like i've never read the exorcist or um what's another good example of like a a classic book to film uh adapt. the it ones the it films are pretty recent and pretty big like, yeah i've never read ones, never so. read it um yeah. i did read um misery though and okay. a couple of other like i've read the shining um, but no, they're just, they're different in my mind. Like, I don't feel like I need one to support the other. I don't think there's even that many movie books that are that much of favorites of mine. Like short, short stories make the best movies. Yep. I really believe that. I think short stories by far make the best movies. It's just, I think that is the right depth of story and length to sort of yes. get into two hours. Like you hear it over and over again. There's too much in a book to get into a film. But, yeah. you know, Shawshank Redemption was a short story. Yeah, yeah, um, for, and that's quite a long film still as well. But yeah, every, no, I think, every part I, about it seems yeah like relevant can, to the story. Yeah, exactly. Like you could do a lot in I, like I'm not sure, but you know the story about um the character that uh the old man that gets released and he has the mm-hmm. bird and everything like in the short story that might have been two pages or something, you know. But yeah. that's enough to then sort of flesh yep. that out into what it became. Um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I reckon um short stories are just yeah. that's, that's where it's at for great film out of it i think anyway yeah I, I was with another episode i was saying to someone too i feel like that argument of the book or the film is better is kind of almost unfair because it's it's pitting two things that aren't really similar at all apart yeah, from know. the fact that they share this the, this the same story yeah the the method of communicating them is entirely different right. so like a, a, an action in a book you know, like a something happens might be an entire page, like you were just saying, worth of worth of text. Yeah, yeah. But in a film, that is a shot or two. You know, like yeah. that's how quick it can move past it because you don't right. have to read all the descriptive details. A quicker shown than read, I think, too. So I, I yeah. always kind of feel like it's a bit of a mute kind of point it is to make they're just different says that. yeah i know what's better a double bacon cheeseburger or a chocolate chip ice cream what do you mean they're both yeah. amazing why am i comparing <laughs> two things what, yes. what are you talking about <laughs> um we'll jump on now we'll go to your first movie trailer oh here we go the 70s yes this is here for duel this is what i mean about an obscure like i could have i was so close to going with the exorcist it could have been obviously you could say something like um chinatown the godfather i love kramer versus kramer um yep. even i don't know just said that it could be there's just so much incredible you know dustin hoffman was that is uh the the straw dogs uh, uh, a clockwork orange barry yep. linden but i went with jewel because it's just there's something about the energy of this film it was steven spielberg's first feature he didn't even it was not even originally a feature film it was a made tv TV movie movie. yeah and um and it just works and i watched it the other night and it still works and it's 50 years old and it is a bloke in a car getting chased by a truck and that's the whole movie and i i i think what i love about The movies that I love the most are movies that are tight and they're not just tight in the execution or the pacing. They're tight in the theme and in the, I mean, you've got your theme and then you've got your pricey, right? What's the action? Give me the setup. Like what's it about? 
So yes, it's about a man in a car being chased by a truck, but what's it about is uh, masculinity or lack thereof being emasculated, um, sort of uh, vengeance, confusion, uh, dominance. You know, it's David and Goliath. There's a lot of, um, there's some sexual undertones to it in terms of, there's a very effective scene in it where he is on the road, but he phones his wife from a payphone and she just has one, one scene, but it's sort of so pivotal because it sets up that he's, she sort of wanted him to, she wanted him to defend her at a, at a cocktail party and he didn't. And she thinks she's sort of, he's apologizing, but he's also thinks she's blowing it out of proportion. And she mentions that one of his friends practically raped her. And so, you know, it was sort of like that, that is such an amazing sort of uh it it's not you would say necessary to the action but what it does is necessary to the emotion that the action then you know plays off against and um it's really intelligent and that's the other thing i i some of my favorite movies are movies that are quote unquote genre but there's so much intelligence that underpins the way that genre plays out so yes. you know you can really read a lot into it, but also at the end of the day, it is just a fucking truck chasing a car. car. And that is so hard to do and sustain interest. Yes. And I, I watched it the other night and just the, the shot choices are continually inventive throughout the runtime. Yeah. You and, think um, with a, a similar premise, you yeah. know, you could get repetitive in using the same yes. kind of yeah. setups over and over. Yeah, which is but there he's he's throwing shots in at minute eighty that you haven't seen before, yes. you know, and it's like and it's elevating the drama and that elevating yeah. the tension, and it's so tense. Yeah, um, it's clever. It's cool. And I just yeah, really, it's it's a movie. I think that I know. I was trying to look at what are the what is the common thread to why, like you said, pick your four favorites. I'm like, well, that's what are you doing to me? Like, I can't, you know, <laughs> if you said to me, pick 25 movies and go and live on a desert island and they're the only ones you get for the rest of your life, that I couldn't do. So four yeah. is mental. But yeah. I, <laughs> when I did it, I looked at the thread and I think, I think in a way, the common thread and, uh, you know, everyone I think does this in certain ways is just, I grew up with them. Yeah. And I don't know why or how, but I think this movie just played on TV from time to time and I grew yeah. up with it. So and there's I like love a nostalgia it. attachment. Yeah, yes. To it. And yeah. I love it for that reason, but that's not the only reason. And um, and I was really struck again the other night just by how, yes, the car is from 1971. And so is, you know, the truck's even older than that. And, you know, it was probably shot on 16. And, you know, of course it's not slick the way yep. that films are now. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's so good. It's just yeah so good and there's so many moments and just the different setups within the runtime that you know you think well how can you sustain that but it's like well he overtakes him and then they, he speeds up and then he sort of runs off the road and then he yeah, yeah, like, yeah. has a breather and goes into a cafe and then he's trying to just you know he's the truck stops so then when he's in the men's room that he assumes then the truck is in there so he's looking at the different guys we haven't seen the trucker's face we're looking at his the boots different boots of them is mm -hmm. it him is it him so they sort of break it up with there's the cafe scene then there's like a scene with the school bus where he's, you know, the the um, man, the driver can't help the school bus get started, but then the truck comes and the, the, the car like races off terrified and the truck pushes the bus and gets it going. So there's that emasculation yes, theme yes, in there yes. again. And then there's a scene at, at a um, level crossing with a train and the uh, okay. truck comes along and threatens him with that. And it's just very, it's just super cool. It's tight. It's a tight, tense lump in the throat yeah sweat on the brow the mouth is dry it's like balls to the wall tight as a drum little thriller really yeah, nice. really really effective and i just love too that it's steven spielberg's first movie and there's a, like a like you could pick four you could pick four conventionally quote-unquote better films from steven spielberg's filmmaking career like you know yeah. straight away but i just i love this one the most yeah sure can you, what about how, like imagine for Spielberg too like this is his first film as we were saying and a made for TV film mm. and the ego boost the guy gets when he gets told hey this is actually excellent so we're going to yeah. give you this much more money to make approximately fifteen minutes more so we can imagine put this that. in theaters like yeah oh like maybe maybe um maybe I should hang around in this industry and like 
you know, yeah, like really have a go at it. Yeah. He's like, like basically a kid. He's 23. He's just like yeah. this way, talked his way up into getting this shot at this thing. It was a short story. Like we were saying, Richard Matheson, he, he, great writer. Yes. And um, that's like a, uh, I Am Legend and stuff, or I Mega Man is the book, but I Am Legend is the Yeah, film, he's, right? there's some good like sci fi writing in there and other things yeah. that uh, I don't, I can't quite bring it off the top of my head, but I know he's written other great um, films that got adapted, uh, great short stories that got adapted into great films. And um, yeah. yeah, he, Spielberg's, um, somebody he worked with had read it. I think it was in Playboy, Playboy of all things. Okay. And um, he went, this is it. This is going to work. And he, so he yeah. just sort of got, he begged to, you know, get a, um, get a shot at doing it and they gave it to him. But yeah, it was 74 minutes because it was made for TV. So with ad breaks, you get the movie time. Yeah. And they went, yeah, That's exactly crazy. what you said. They're like, this thing's working, like go and shoot some more and then we'll release it in Europe and stuff. So he did. Yeah. That's mental. That actually yeah, blows my mind. Brilliant. I know oh, like, it could that's... never happen now. No way. There's no way they'd risk that much money on someone so young either. Like that is it. crazy. Yeah. I, I really tried to cool. find trivia for this, but it, obviously it's kind of of age before the internet. So not that much seemed to exist that I didn't think you would already know. Mm. Uh, the only interesting part was someone's done a count of how many times uh, David Mann looks in the rear vision mirror and it's oh, nice. uh, 65 <laughs> times over, uh, sorry, 65 times and over his shoulder, 54 times. There you go. Yeah. So quite a few. His uh, neck would have been sore after the. I think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so, great. That's I think so be, cool. Yeah. I'll have to, I tried to watch it before we recorded this and, uh, some circumstances prevented that, but it's it is one that has been on the watch list for quite some time. So I'll have to hopefully Fantastic. come around to it before the year finishes. But well, I hope I haven't bigged it up too much because, like I said, <laughs> then I, I think my, it, I think my childhood shorts, nostalgia <laughs> is definitely adding a few stars onto the rating here. Yes, but um, even just like the even the way the truck looks, like Spielberg cast this particular truck because it had, in his words, a face. And right. there's something so menacing about this dirty brown oil tanker flammable kind of truck yes. and the sound of it and the way the driver would like wave. He like has this hand okay. motion to sort of wave the driver to like yeah. overtake him. And then he tries to, you know, run him off the road. And it's just, it's just so like, it's fucked up. It's existentially, yeah. you know, scary. And, yeah. and it's so, but it's so relatable too. It could sure. it happen to anyone. Um, and I just think it just is a great watch, especially at night. <laughs> I thought, yeah, true. I'm sure that would be the best time to watch it. Uh, I uh, I have a question actually I thought of. I meant I was thinking about this today. Um, I didn't write it down, so I nearly forgot. Sorry. So have you seen um, Ready Player One, the yeah. Spielberg? So I don't think it is, but I'm sure I've read it somewhere maybe when it initially came out, but I couldn't find it anywhere when I was looking for stuff on this. In Ready Player One, there's this kind of big car race chase. Thing yeah, I remember. Start. Yeah, And there is a bit where they're in a DeLorean that yeah. kind of skids underneath a truck. But is right. it the truck from Duel? Because I, I have a feeling that the truck in Duel is a semi-trailer that's covered, but I, for some reason, picture this one in Ready Player One just being yeah. a like a flatbed trailer thing. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I that is ringing a faint bell. Like I know that they did load that scene with a lot of references. Yeah. It, it might be the truck from like, it's not like the liquid nitrogen truck from T2 maybe, or something Perhaps, like that. Maybe. But yeah, I don't know. I think the dual truck would have stood out too much because it's really dirty and old and yeah, you know, okay. not, not like clean and futuristic and stuff. So yeah, I'm not sure, but um, geez, they, they did a great job casting that truck though because yes man, <laughs> it still sticks so, out it's there so you go. cool so cool and another yeah. thing just a real quick another thing yeah he, spielberg was adamant and oh, i don't kind of don't want to spoil it but like you know there's a classic thing that happens in almost all movies right when you know there's going to be some sort of um collision or like a mm -hmm. big event with a vehicle right obviously we get a you know there's the kaboom yes. moment everyone's waiting for and um he, despite the truck saying flammable in big letters, and, you know, that's where I'd like, if obviously it was made any time in the last, you know, 25 years since Die Hard or whatever, yeah. it'd be like, with the, you can imagine the execs are like, well, obviously it's going to go kaboom at the end, right? Like, I mean, give, <laughs> give the people what they want. It's rule one. Yes. Um, but he resisted it and he was adamant. Yeah, okay. It's not going to go kaboom. Okay. So, you know, and that's just, it, I think it's one of the things that almost leaves you 
wanting more you know the films that are the, you know the films that itch your brain and you don't know why and then you realize it's because there's sort of been something that's left undone and you watch it again and again because you're trying to you're trying to put that bow on that thing that's left undone i think yeah the shining is a film like that where okay it's sort of it i feel like it changes every time you watch it it's sort of the the shining is like a it's like a maze itself it's like a, a puzzle it's like a mystery it's a shape shifter of a film and i sure. think you go back to it because you're you're sort of trying to f- fix it or solve it or you know finish it it's like you want to add something to it that completes it or see if it's changed this time or see if it's yes. done the thing that you want it to do yeah and i think jewel fits in that category as well which makes okay. to me makes it evergreen cuz you just want to keep coming back to it over and over again for sure and that probably obviously makes it easier too because it's kind of whatever you need it to be on yeah the time yeah yep. nice i like that that's cool mm. um we'll move on we'll jump into some more questions before the next trailer uh movie soundtracks and score what do you what sticks oh. out to you as the best of these i'm sure you'll have uh, some for these man look it's a, this is a cheat answer because i can't just i'm not just going to reel off like a couple of scores but space movies for me mm-hmm. and i know that's such a general dumb answer but i actually i realized like earlier this year this must have been a bit of another bit of lockdown boredom but i was like god damn there's some good space movie soundtracks like just and particular cues that really stuck in my mind there's a brilliant cue from gravity stephen price um mm-hmm. i think won the oscar for gravity um interstellar that incredible sequence with the spinning um sequence and the docking and the the organs you know the organs um by Hans Zimmer and then First Man has an absolutely insane score by Justin Hurwitz he was he was robbed of the um Academy Award that year for some bizarre reason he wasn't nominated and and missed out on the nominations but he would have won there's not a shred of doubt in my mind that he would have won that year for First Man because there's the landing sequence is incredible and he uses like a um uh, what is the instrument called it's not a um oh i know the one you're thinking of too either or a um Um, it's a really bizarre harmonic sort of like yeah sort of like pheromones no that's that's like a i'll just find it theremin it's the theremin theremin. i don't know how you pronounce it theremin yeah, there um, looks... this bizarre yeah. instrument. Um, anyway, first man, and I just I was like, I'm gonna make a playlist. So I jumped on Spotify, and before I knew it, I had like 25 different scores in this playlist. Not the full score, but just the one like standout cue from each of these. Mm-hmm. Even sunshine, you know, when um, you know, Canada goes to land on the sun, and the shields like he has to fix the shield, and then the sun comes, you know, and um, yeah, brilliant. There's something about being in space. And I just, I don't know what it is, but I think it elevates composers to sort of go to that next level of like, whether it's in inventiveness or like with her, it's, you know, different instrument or uh, just, yeah, the ingenuity that goes into sort of yeah. something that's like otherworldly, like quite literally. Yeah. Yeah. They're so, yeah. I think it might so be a good. bit of like compensation for the fact that there is no sound in space and particularly gravity's. Uh, yeah. use of it too because she's so um, isolated too and it's yeah sort of, yeah yeah you may be right you notice it that much more in a, in a way because it's so integral to the emotion yeah. of the experience and sort of what you are hearing but like they just sound so fucking cool yeah some of these it's... choices and some of these different cues and even yeah like the interstellar score particularly like i, I remember the hairs are standing up on the back of my neck just this incredible docking scene mm-hmm. it's just it was nuts. It's it's on another yeah. level. Have you so, seen the video online of um, the guy that's putting in a light bulb with a drone, and they've put that song music on it? And it's, that's it's amazing. Like, no, I have it. They've put like a GoPro on the fan, so it's like amazing. spinning around the drone. <laughs> it's awesome. That's yeah, perfect use of that. Yeah. I'm sure Zimmer would appreciate it. I'm sure he would too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then what about like um, soundtrack? Do you have one for soundtrack that really sticks out? As in, like, um, existing uh, like needle, songs. needle drops, yeah, yeah, like exist pop songs, radio music, and um, stuff. I, th- I guess, I think most people kind of cite um, Guardians or yeah. Baby Driver, but I did, I thought they were both a bit affected. I didn't, they didn't do much for me. Like, I thought it was sort of, 
I don't know, just uh, a little too look at me or listen mm-hmm. to me, you know, in both of those examples. Um, but yeah, soundtrack uh, with actually, you know, there's a film, uh, an early Daniel Craig film called Layer Cake. Yep. Uh, that had Matthew a pretty, Vaughan that film. had a pretty yeah. rad soundtrack. Um, I actually had, I remember having the CD soundtrack of that. And okay. I gave that a spin a bunch of times. Um, and that was pretty distinct and, and pretty cool. Um, but no, I'm kind of drawing a blank. What do you, okay. what, what, what's your answer? For I am. Um... You know what? I, I keep thinking about this, and a lot of people, you're right. In the episodes I've done, I've said like Guardians. Yeah. I thought Pulp would come up more than it has, and it really hasn't come up that much. Yeah. But, and hear me out. Shrek. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, I can understand where you're coming from. Yep, yeah, I get it. I think I was a child of the time, so that was something that was played in the car a lot yeah. of the time. If we yeah. were anyway, so I just remember the more fondly. It, for that. It's clever that they went. Yeah, they could have just gone with the you know, classic animation score, but they're like, no, well, let's throw some you know contemporary songs in, yeah. and uh, and you know, get get this burrowed into the brains of you know toddlers and children yeah. worldwide, and it's obviously worked. <laughs> Yes, it definitely did on me and, and my sister, I think, too. She still uh, <laughs> sings a bit of Smash Mouth, I think. Of course, who doesn't? Um, when I asked you to do this, this was one of the questions I told you that was on there and you responded very uh, excitedly to this one when I oh, yeah. even said that I asked it. So I'm really excited to see what you said for this one. Uh, what is the best-looking film? Uh, yes, well, we're going to enter super nerd territory now. If sure. the if the uh, sort of Dolby surround uh, and you know, <laughs> sound placement conversations weren't enough. Um, I have felt for a long time and it really struck me when I saw it for the first time. I saw it multiple times since and it's always something I come back to. And it's a film called Snow Falling on Cedars. Um, okay, it was directed by Scott Hicks, an Australian. It was his next yeah. movie after Shine, which won the Oscar for Jeffrey Rush. And... It was shot by Robert Richardson, who uh, has won Oscars himself and works. But Snow Falling on Cedars is um, it was based on a book. It it's, um, deals a little bit with um, Japanese sort of internment of American Japanese citizens. And it's um, set in a very snowy uh, area of the country, um, as the title would suggest. And what they did was, I looked into it because I was in film school at the time this was released. And so this was sort of a bit of a talking point because it was like, what have they done with this film? And Robert Richardson used what they call the uh, bleach bypass process. So when you develop the neg, um, you know, the film goes through different baths to sort of develop Mm -hmm. the neg and, uh, and expose it correctly and do what it needs to be done. But they, part of that is like a bleach, uh, tub that the film will like wind through and so bleach bypass will emit that stage of the process so by doing that it doesn't bleach off I think some of the like film no, I think we're getting really into the weeds here but film basically works with like tiny like microscopic kind of uh, fragments of silver halide crystals like within the celluloid of the neck and, and that's what gets exposed to light so the more that mm-hmm. burns from the light the darker it gets or the lighter it stays or you know um relatively speaking so the bleach bypass leaves i think some of that silver halide on the neg and what you get is really silvery whites and really inky blacks sure it just sort of changes the look of the image to uh it's not exactly like sort of an alien look or anything but it just it deep, like I said, you get these deep inky blacks and you get these still, so you can imagine a movie with snow, if you've got like slightly silvery yeah, 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 sort yeah, yeah. of ethereal looking snow and um, it just looks magnificent. Like it's, yeah, it, nice. it was nominated for the Oscar. Uh, it lost to American Beauty, uh, which was shot by Conrad Hall, which was also incredible that year, but yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It's so worth a look. Like even just um, yeah. if you can find a good HD trailer of it, just to get the get that. Barry Lyndon is another amazing one too. They, I think Kubrick actually, I don't know how accurate, I might be making this up, but I think he actually worked with NASA in some aspect. Yeah, He's right. insane. It's insane enough to be true when, you know, considering it's Kubrick that yeah. NASA developed some sort of lens with him because it was all shot with candlelight. So this mm-hmm. crazy motherfucker is going, no, you can keep all of your, you know, your big 10 Ks and all the rest of it in the barn. Mm-hmm. We're just going to light candles because it was, it's a uh, Barry Lyndon's like a, 
uh, you know, 17th century British, you know, kind of like pistols at dawn. Yes, like, yes, yes. You know, bops with wigs and powdered, you know, faces and what have you playing cards. And they're all just sitting around with candles everywhere. And it was all just shot with candlelight, which is which was unheard of because the film wasn't fast enough and the lenses weren't open enough to do that. So we made lenses that would be open enough yeah, nice. to expose the film with candlelight. It looks insane. It's incredible. Yeah, You've got to see it. Mental. I've just added it to a list now. I'm yeah. I have to check Barry that Linden, one out too. Barry Linden. And also <laughs> anything shot by Deacons is amazing, obviously. Pretty mesmerizing. Yeah. I mean, he's incredible. I was, I was just so happy finally for him to win. Uh, you know, the poor guy is nominated over and over again. And it became this sort of thing that he hadn't won. And then Skyfall looked so incredible that I thought, I was like, well, this is an un- this would be an unusual cinematography win, but it's deserved, you know? And then he didn't win yeah. for that. And so I'm like, oh man, he's getting older. I hope this happens. And then boom, back to back with um, 1917. And yes. what was the one that broke it for uh, him? Blade, like, Runner, ba- Blade Runner. Before, yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. Which were both undeniable like undeniable yes. you're just like oh he's got this in the bag and then to do it yeah. you know back to back was brilliant and it was and awesome he yeah. so deserved it because so it kind of cool. felt like I, I agree i remember hearing about that with you thinking like he'll get it and it'll be like leo getting it for um wolf of wall street it'll kind of right. just be like oh it's about time we'll just give you this one whatever yeah sure and i was like oh that would probably happen to this poor guy too like he'll probably get it retire but exactly what you were just saying mm. to get it. And then the following year, do this like most ambitious, brilliant uh, one, yeah. one take, appearing one take. It, film, which, you know, like, and it's funny that, cause in a way, um, so Manuel Lebeski kind of pulled that off too. And he did three, the three Pete. And then yeah. one of those was Birdman, which is sort of your one take look, but exactly. Yeah. The Revenant was incredible. Like that yes. was, uh, he just, he won that thing walking in the door, like with that. Yeah um and so i yeah winning three is back to back is super cool that's a great isn't start. it yeah, yeah for sure i would have loved if deacons could have done that too and matched him three for yes. three. it would have been great yeah i didn't realize too he was so he was in australia i guess 2015 because he did unbroken the angelina jolie oh cool yeah film. Right. so he would have been down on the gold coast and stuff um nice weird story but when i um caught june the other week um we, you know they were because it was the premiere there's sort of like an mc at the at the front saying hey everyone this is going to be exciting welcome to this da, da, da. oh and by the way can we just have a quick uh shout out where uh where are you kyle and kyle mclaughlin was at the june yeah. screening at the you know june he was in the row in front of me yeah and this is you know how weird to think that he started in, in june in 1984 or whatever for, for lynch and yep. then 35 37 years goes by and then he's in brisbane shooting something else and yeah he's goes to the premiere of the the, the remake, remake of a film very, he was in. very yeah. cool he, he seems Isn't i it? think he really dug it i think he liked it yeah i'll move on again what about the funniest film what's the funniest film you've ever seen i um struggle with this because i think my my i consider like myself like a real i really appreciate a comedy on film and television and, and it's mm-hmm. my thing. Like I, I, I revolve around that. It's my yes. go-to, but I also don't really laugh at movies that much. Sure. And I, I don't really like, I can really enjoy a comedy and I think it's funny and, and enjoy it. And I think it's great, but I actually don't laugh throughout the whole movie really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I kind of don't know how to answer. I, I love, what I call that um, ZAZ comedy, the Zucker, Abraham Zucker stuff. Yes. So flying high, naked gun. Um, I really, I really dig that, that because I think it's extremely clever to be extremely silly. I really, yep. there's something about that kind of humor. Sure. Uh, it's an absurd answer because it's not, it is, it's a poor film, but there's a movie called National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon 1. So okay. it's obviously a, yeah. a piss take of, you know, uh, Lethal Weapon 1, 2, 3, et yeah. cetera. So it's called Loaded Weapon 1. It's got Emilio Estevez and Samuel L. Sure. Jackson. This okay. pre-Pulp Fiction Samuel L. Jackson. He's on the cusp of breaking out. Yep. And it, it and it's not that it's that great or that funny, but I'm in, I am in tears watching it because, sure. similar to before, I grew up watching it. And yeah, I can yeah. quote, endless lines from loaded weapon one with my brother and sister it's part of our daily dialogue like we will just talk about things anything in life 
and then we'll pull a movie, pull a, a line out of Loaded Weapon One and just crack each other up. Yeah, uh, because we just, you know, grew up in the same yeah. other, way that other families would talk about The Lion King or Princess Bride or The Goonies or Gremlins or something that they just that is like their thing that they have yeah. on tape or something and they play yeah, it over sure. and over again. Um, yeah. I even shudder to think like how it would play now because it's just, even as those flying high naked gun movies go, it's not that great. Like it's not as good as hot shots uh, yeah, or anything like yeah. that. But, you know, I love in hot shots when it's <laughs> say, you know, you've got Lloyd Bridges and <laughs> just someone will ask him a question and the answer is pudding. And cause he's eating pudding. He like plaps pudding yep. that lands on someone else's face. And then they, but they just carry on. It's so funny. Yeah that, yeah, yeah, that to me is brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of no, thing nice. cracks me up. And actually, I have to say, too, um, I was really surprised with, uh, I finally got around to, it, this movie is more than 50 years old now, but the original The Producers by Mel Brooks. Okay, yeah. Really, really holds up. I was so okay. surprised. It's just packed with energy and wit yeah. and you know i can imagine in 1968 by you know if it works by today's standards people mind would have been blown by just you know the by the pace of it you know and the energy of it it's really really good yeah yeah nice i haven't mm. i'm sure i think i've only seen parts of the remake like the matthew broderick mm. yeah uh and i can't remember Nathan Lane or yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's him I've seen parts of that one on like yeah. Foxtel when we had that, but never yeah. quite all the way through. And I was probably too young to appreciate it as well. So that yeah, that I didn't think like I would like to come back to the original too much. But yeah, the producers was a cracker. Very good. We'll go to the the opposite end of that spectrum. What is the saddest film you oh. think you've ever seen? Oh man! Well, holy shit! I mean, there's scenes I can think yeah. of, like you know, there's the scene that obviously fucked up an entire generation Artax the horse drowning in the swamp of sadness and okay. the never ending story if sure. you grew up as a kid like in the 80s and i don't know what i mean i'd love to know more than what your like equivalent of this might be because like the never ending story just like fucked kids up yeah because there's there's a swamp of sadness which is quicksand and this kid has a horse and the horse drowns yes the horse drowns, drowns. yep in the yeah, swamp, and that's it he doesn't have the horse anymore and it's yeah. not like I mean, every movie ever, the horse, you know, the animal would be fine. And they would find like, oh, quick, there's a vine. And they like wrap it around the animal when it climbs out and it's fine. Safe. Yeah. No, nope, not Wolfgang Peterson. I'm going to fuck <laughs> up your dreams, kids. I've got that German sensibility yeah. and I'm just going to shit on your childhood. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be one. And I That's also fun. always, I can't, I always cry at uh, when he's at Jenny's grave, when Forrest Gump's at Jenny's grave. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, spoiler alert. Sorry, guys. Jenny dies in Forrest Gump, but you know he's at the <laughs> at the grave and he says, "You you died on a Saturday." And he's talking about, "Oh man, fucking gets me every time." There's just yeah. something about the way it's built for the two hours and twenty five minutes sort of before that, and then yeah, you know, it's just a it's a climactic. Yeah. yeah. Say what you will, because I know I think there's a lot of hate chucked at Forrest Gump because effectively, you know, it'd be Pulp Fiction, which you know I think people certain people kind of hold up as you know. But it just, it still works, well, man. And, have you, and Tom Hanks, with, that character, like that was a risk, you know, that could have, yeah, like, you never, absolutely. never go full retard, obviously. No, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. he really, he really sold it in. So like yeah. it, um, yeah. But have you, have you heard the theory just with what you're saying then about like it, it beating Pulp is that the film that often wins gets forgotten about, but the nominees that it lost to are often more. Oh, of course. Well well, Shawshank was one of them as well. So look at yeah. that. When you've got, you know, it beats Shawshank and Pulp Fiction and people go, what, you know, you look back and go, what were they on? But it's like, well, no, put yourself there. Like it, in yeah. the moment in that era. And, you know, often emotion will rule, you know, intellect yeah. or what have you. And it swept people along. Like it doesn't deserve to be hated solely for that reason it's a yeah. flipping good movie it really holds up and like what they pulled off with effects and everything as well just to just to make it work just to make yeah. you believe it Absolutely. um it was really really good gear um and so yeah i think you know you can kind of legacies can be affected yeah in that sense because of yeah you sure. look at what it beat and go what the but yeah nah. but they're just scenes you know so i i was thinking like 
overall and it might be maybe i'm colored by just the recency of it but like over as a whole as a sad film i'm i reckon i'd say the father um, okay yeah it's pretty recent too. yeah it was so brilliantly done like mm-hmm. really moving but just in a really extraordinary way like not uh sort of mawkishly you know you think oh well those family movies where someone gets you know you've got still alice with julianne moore and stuff like you know the person's changing then they you know they're not yeah, themselves, yeah. And, and it's really you know it's a certain type that i think is yeah. sort of a little formulaic um but the father was not that at all it was the furthest thing for formula i've seen in ages and it was it, it was the last film i cried watching for sure okay um yeah and i was so happy that it won for hopkins and the screenplay and and yeah. slightly personally because um they were what i tipped on my oscars tipping and okay. no one else yeah, did yeah. though also sure. chadwick boseman yeah and i tipped um anthony hopkins and the screenplay to win and it won both so i was yeah nice doubly excited because i was pumped that i got my oscar tips correct Very good. but they really 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 deserved both of those and yeah. it was awesome that the academy like actually recognized yeah the nice. work that was done because it was genuinely like on the screenplay side it was super inventive and extremely clever the way they played with like um the the cutting and the and the uh the t- sort of the time loops that yeah. you have to see see it to understand how it sort of folds in on itself and it's really it plays with time and plays brilliantly to put you in the place of like someone who's suffering from dementia sure and how difficult that is to understand for the people around them around um yeah. and yeah man i would that was probably i would even put it as the film the the best film of last year yeah um, nice but cool. yeah definitely definitely very sad but in just the in the best way if that makes sense yeah very good um what about the scariest film you've ever seen Ooh. What do you think that is? um i would do you know what back to the 70s man can you beat the exorcist can can it be beaten i figured you might say that one yeah <laughs> did you yeah i just you just believe this girl is possessed you just believe yeah. it I mean, the film is bonkers yeah. and it starts, it's not perfect. Like it starts with this dark archeological dig and they find this, you know, Huzuzu possessed like figurine thing. And like, what does that have to yeah. do with anything? Like it, it's kind of got a bit of nutty hoo-ha sort of like, you know, evil spirits mm-hmm. sort of thing, which in my mind, you don't even need, there doesn't need to be, you don't need to justify There's no physical reason why it needs to happen. But the, yeah. the rest of the movie you just believe that she is possessed by the devil. It's brilliant. Like, yeah, how good is that? Uh, yeah. And then, so when you believe that, if you can, if they make, if they can convince you the ability to suspend the disbelief that it's like insane that this girl has the devil inside her, mm-hmm. when you do believe it, everything that happens to her is fucking terrifying. Yes. <laughs> because yeah. the, it's the devil. And it's just, oh man, man. Yeah. yeah brilliant. That stair coming down yeah. the stairs backwards. Is got to be one of the most brilliant things ever put on yes. celluloid. It's Sensational. Um, it's so nice. I have, I really struggle with horror ones. Hey, like I am um, yeah, working in cinema. If I was ever doing anything upstairs, I'd mm-hmm. shut all the portholes. If there was a horror film playing in there, apart from the one that the yeah. light is going through, just to not have to, <laughs> just to not have to witness have it. You, I really didn't like it. Have you ever seen Misery? It's more of no, a. This is more so, no. like existential terror. I don't know that it's. You'd say it's. Not, it's not scary like uh, things jump out at you. It's scary as in what if this happened to you? Like because mm-hmm. it's Stephen King and he's a writer and he has an accident and a nurse finds him and she takes him back. To oh, her I've heard about this. Yeah, you've got to see. Crook. You have to see Misery, yeah. man. You've got to see Misery. Yes. Kathy Bates won Kathy an Bates Oscar. And, um, James Khan. James Khan. Yeah. yeah, and she won for a horror movie it never happens it's it's, yeah. in, it's insane and yeah, um yeah. she was they're both brilliant and like my wife refuses i've been trying for 15 years to get her to watch misery with me and she won't watch it because yeah. she, she knows that he gets sort of um trapped and yeah um tortured in a way yeah um but it's about so much more than that she's she's a crazed fan because he's an yeah. author and she loves his books ah uh, right and right. um so she goes off the deep end like carrying him nursing him back to hell yeah. and it's it's a it's a bit like jewel in that you're kind of in one location and you're stuck and you want to know how how the so, good guy is going to escape the bad guy yeah yeah and on, yeah. that's what i i love lean efficient 
films like that. Storytelling, you know? Yeah. Tight, yeah. like I said, tight in the in the premise. The premise is tight. They're in one room. How do they get out? I love stuff like that. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah I think I know what you mean. That's um, I, I've heard about the specifically the scene with the hammer onto the knees. Yeah, of course. And I think that's the one everyone's heard about. If the hobbling, heard, yes, it's yeah, the hobbling. Um... Well, can I tell you a little trivia here? In the book, the Stephen King novel, she cuts his feet off with no. a um, either a torch, a flamethrower, or a it might be an axe. Uh, maybe she um cauterizes the stumps with a flamethrower but she cuts his feet off with an axe that's in the novel and they i think goldman adapted the screenplay to 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 retain that and i think it might have been um this was directed by rob reiner of all people oh okay it's brilliant and he i think it might have been him that went we can't do that because he was like it's a brilliant idea in the book but again, like we were saying, book and film, very different film. Yeah. It's right. It's you're looking at it, it's in your face, being yeah. put in your eyeballs to communicate the idea. And you're not reading it, imagining it, it's being put in your eyes. And he yes. said that we will lose them if we do that. That's too much. Yeah. That's and, and yeah. And I think if people were annoyed about it, and then and then I think Goldman afterwards went, You're absolutely right. You made the right choice. Like I was yeah. wrong. And you were right to change it. So yeah, pretty good. Yeah, right. It's, it, um, it sounds like it's the part that everyone remembers too. As well. so <laughs> sure it's probably it's, worth changing it's it. It's very memorable, man. The yeah. whole movie is great though. Um, one more in this space. What is the, uh, what's a film that you still can't believe that you haven't seen? Yeah, you know, I've never, I, I think of myself as a cinephile, right? And I'm trying to go yeah. back through all the classics. And I had a, a list that I made when I was still in film school with, I think it has 350 or so. 380 classics on it from, you know, all that stuff that people should tell you, you need to see the third man and you need to yes. see, you know, it's obvious Casablanca, um, you know, films of the sixties and seventies, Truffaut and Polanski. And you need to catch up on all this formative stuff, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, you know, those, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I've never seen a Charlie Chaplin film. Okay. Yeah. I'm with you there too. Actually. I haven't. I've never seen one. I've seen Amazing like, one. obviously you see the little clips and the bits and you see the sort of things, you know, in the, in the Oscars sort of montages where, uh, you know, the classic sort of things that, that he uh, like skates uh, close to the edge of a big wide opening that he's going to fall down, but he just stops at the last second or whatever. But yep. I've never actually never, I'd never even had come close to even watching one. Like, They've never, I never see them on TV, even growing yeah. up, they weren't around, I, you know, it seemed like they weren't on VHS or whatever when I was a kid, like I've never gone to buy one at JB Hi-Fi, yeah. I just never seen a whole movie. I don't yeah. know if I ever will. I don't know that I, you know, need to go that far to complete, like yeah, I've seen I, Buster Keaton films, I've seen the general. I feel like we've like, shifted yeah. so far past them that it's probably not. Yeah, we're getting like up to worth, like a hundred yeah. years ago now and yeah. um you know it's yeah probably i mean that's on me like i should you know he probably he literally invented like a, a genre but um mm-hmm. yeah not so far yeah. anyway yeah no good one i agree with that one i don't mm. think i can see myself seeing them either that's a good one yeah um we will now move on to your second trailer ahead of our feature film and this is for rain man well we're in the again, 80s now too we're in the right? 80s 1988 it won best picture uh, and director and actor for Dustin Hoffman and screenplay. And um, I, again, I grew up with it. It was just on TV. It was on TV a lot. I think Channel 10 ran a lot. And um, I don't know why, but it just grabbed me and it got its claws in. And it is one of my favorite films of all time. It was um, shot by John Seal, an Australian. It's brilliantly mm-hmm. shot. Um, but I think every aspect of it works. Um, and from the, op- from the opening second... And it opens with um, a song called Ico Ico. And the whole sort of film weirdly has this African inspired, it's got nothing to do with Africa at all, but Hans Zimmer scored the film. And I think he just was after something different. And so it infuses the whole film with this. I think this was Hans Zimmer's like first. It was really yeah, early. It was, it was yeah. like his first like yeah, big I guess Hollywood it was just... thing going to try to be experimental with it yeah so and it's, it's actually not that much music by him either i read yeah I like include it but it's a really it's something only 15 16 minutes or something yeah like that, sure yeah it's sort of like it's a film made up of like yeah there is sort of um 
there's throwback sort of not uh contemporary there's like uh it's like a soundtrack film with with um existing songs yeah and then his themes which are just they're embedded in my mind it's like i sure. i they're it, it it's so evocative the way that he uses these non-traditional instruments and there's pan flutes in there and sort of african jar- drums yeah. and strange things but um you know at its core it's this you know this uh arrogant selfish younger brother who discovers he's got this uh an autistic older brother and he effectively steals him and drives across the country with him to sort of force yeah, okay, the nice. facility's hand into um uh, he kind of blackmails them into I, he's his their father has died and he wants to get a bigger share of the inheritance sure and the journey of the film is is him letting go of his arrogance and his um selfishness and his materialism and sort of learning to and and connecting with his brother and then learning to i suppose accept differences and to grow as a person and the irony of all of that is that um Dustin Hoffman won the Oscar for best actor, but his character has no arc yeah, because yeah. he doesn't it's change just, uh... from minute one to minute 120. And Tom Cruise is the one who's car- who actually demonstrates yeah. a full arc change. in that yeah. film. Yeah. And um, it's kind of hilarious that, you know, of course it's like you've, he's, you've done a brilliant trick, have an Oscar yeah. because you've played somebody different and yeah. um, you know, it's sort of, We've seen it over and over again with My Left Foot and with The King's Speech and with all yeah. kinds of stuff like that. But um, yeah, I just, I love how it looks. I love how it sounds. I love how it's performed. I love how it's directed. I love the dialogue. And I just, it's a film that- It's the, referenced quite a lot still. It's referenced quite a lot. The 80s. Like it's, yes. quite, it's brought up in other, like The Hangover and stuff in particular yeah. comes to mind when you, you think about it still being referenced in like pop culture and stuff. So it's yeah, that's true. continually it comes did, up too. Yeah. It's funny because it made a big impact in pop culture, but I think it's also in a funny way still to this day sort of underappreciated. I don't think it comes up very much in terms of people, like conversations like this. I don't think it's yes. mentioned very much in terms of, the weight of sort of film history. I think mm-hmm. it's mentioned as a punchline, like you say, like it's it's a very memorable thing that yes. what Dustin Hoffman does. But I I think as a film, it sort of has still taken a back seat, I think, to other things. If you think of films of the 80s and you might, you know, your head might immediately go to um, Die Hard or Raiders of the Lost Ark or mm-hmm. um, if you're thinking more about dramas or Oscars or whatever, you might think of... Um, the color purple or uh yeah the yeah uh, sophie's choice or so you know big yeah. sort of dramatic films like that but um yeah i just i i love everything about rayman and the sure. the the texture of it um and the way it feels um yeah it's every part of it is mapped into my brain and um it's just done so well that even though i know there are like I said before, there are greater films from the eighties, but it's something that is yeah. just lives in my heart. Yeah, 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 yeah for exactly. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. And we Tom just Cruise kinda... also, if anyone's like, oh, he just does Mission Impossible's and he can't it, sit him in front of Rain Man because he's awesome. He can act. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's good. really good in it. He is. I really think that that period a lot of people haven't kind of got over, but I think he does really make really great, great films. So mm. I think he kind of just gets put into a box yeah that's true yeah way. i mean you um, only have to yeah born of the fourth of july and magnolia and yeah. you know jerry Maguire. it's like the, the dude's got three acting nominations like he yeah, knows man. what he's doing but yeah rayman sure. uh is one that i think yeah kind of you could you know easily just put that in that high oeuvre of of his as well yeah. because he really nails it it also has some very cool cars so i'll just chuck that in yes <laughs> this is another one too when i kind of looked i couldn't really find any trivia that i didn't think would be something that was already kind of known um, about it, but we were just talking about it's shot by John Seal, the Australian mm. guy. And he just did an episode of the Tim Deacons podcast, the Roger Deacons, oh, cool. James Deacon one. And he told a story. Now I'm probably going to tell this wrong, but I'll make it quicker in just in case. <laughs> um, he got asked a question on it by Roger about like, how do, do you feel comfortable on sets? Like, talking to the actors if the director can't like nail down what the problem is or or like if you want to if you have a suggestion you that you think will improve it he's like do you go to the director or do you just say it to the actors and he said oh i'll tell you a story about rain man where i spoke Mm. to dustin hoffman 
and he goes, and I will admit, he says something I think that's like he's they're sitting on a park bench and he just wanted he needs to get up, he walks across the grass and they walk off, and that's the end of the scene. But it had been mapped out and designed that that was going to be covered in like three or four different setups. Yeah. And he said, I went up to Dustin and said, Hey, do you actually think your character would walk across the grass back to the path? Yeah. Or would he walk back to the path in the shortest path yep. possible and then, and then away? And then Dustin's like, Oh, you're right. I wouldn't walk across the grass. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what they did. But he goes, I suggested that purely because I knew it would be three shots that we didn't need to do. So I just wanted to go home earlier. So I suggested it to someone that had more bargaining power than me. Amazing. And it was like, yep, we went home earlier that day because we did it in one shot rather than like well, three or whatever. They were both yeah. right. Cause I remember yeah. that shot and it is very like, there's a robotic, you know, quality to uh, him yeah. playing that character because that's how they behave. And uh, yeah, it works because it immediately shows you in one setup, you know, that Tom Cruise's character is one kind of way and Dustin Hoffman's character is another kind of way. Yes. But that's Which that's is, very funny. That sounds very is. Australian too. So it doesn't it? It's yes, just it like does. the man just wants to go home from work earlier. So he just offers a suggestion and plays <laughs> it off like it's to everyone's benefit. <laughs> There's another great it's story just... about Rain Man that in the previews, you know, they get the cards from people with notes and what have you. And one of the apparently one of the famous um preview cards is <laughs> after Rain Man, it's like I was just waiting the whole time for the little guy to snap out of it. <laughs> so I'm Jeez. not sure that that person had a full appreciation. Yeah, of it, but, uh, I don't think so either. That's um, it's such an American thing to do, isn't too, it? Like just Crazy. to like, and it's it all like we don't know. I'm we don't know that that is who did that, but it's you could assume pretty knowingly yep. that it was like definitely that's yeah. crazy some bored person in burbank going yes. <laughs> snap out of it rain man just quickly was also my, the very first uh, movie i bought on dvd thanks everyone we'll leave uh part one to finish off just there be sure to come back and check out next week for part two where we hear about his uh second and first favorite films see you then Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bottomless Popcorn. For bonus content, news, and upcoming guests, follow us on Instagram at Bottomless Popcorn Pod. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. If you'd like to contact the show, you can email us at bottomlesspopcornpod at gmail.com. And be sure to leave a review of your own favorite film wherever you listen to podcasts.